Hello and welcome to season two of the LuxCast, where we explore the intersections of Christian faith, culture, and our lives. My name is Chuck DeGroat, professor at Western Theological Seminary. In this season, we dive deep with significant thought leaders, pastors, authors, and other interesting conversation partners as we explore one key question with each. Today's one question goes to Dr. Edith M. Humphrey and Dr. John L. Thompson. Dr. Humphrey is professor of New Testament at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and Dr. Thompson is the Galen and Susan Biker Professor of Reformed Theology at Fuller Theological Seminary. The one question they will be discussing is, does drawing on church tradition undermine the centrality and authority of Scripture? We're delighted to be here together today for the LuxCast, and we're discussing a question on pertaining to Scripture and tradition, whether church tradition uh, may undermine the centrality and authority of Scripture, a question that we both considered. Primarily, I think we would want to say no, but like all straightforward questions, there are so many pitfalls uh, to be encountered along the way. What do we mean by tradition? What do we mean by church? And what do we mean by authority? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what do we mean by centrality of Scripture? What that, does it mean to have the Scripture centered? Um, I mean, my, my first um, pushback on the question would be, um, actually, it's Christ who's central. And the Word bears witness to the one who is the Word. So, yes, Scripture is really important um, for the church and has always been, but its, it's most wonderful um, feature is that it shows us Jesus. It points to who the Word is and explains that to us and illuminates him to us. What would you say the, and I know I'm begging several questions here, what would you say the best thing about tradition is? I would want to respond that the best thing about tradition is that it is um, the life breath of the church that connects us through the ages to the apostles who learned directly from Christ, who saw him with um, physical eyes, as we hope sometime to do with renewed um, eyes in the new creation. And as some do, they tell us, um, even now, although that seems to be rare. What parts of um, tradition would you say are l either less important? I mean, how would you, how would you define, you, you, you've defined tr tradition largely along its creedal spine, I would say, and I would agree with that completely, that, that, that mm -hmm. first of all, uh, tradition tells us who this Jesus was, what his message was, what his work was, to use a traditional phrase, mm -hmm. that changed the world and changes us. But people bring a lot of baggage with them uh, when they talk about tradition, at least mm -hmm. in some cases. The Protestant Reformation was a lot about uh, setting aside the so-called uh, contrived traditions, never at all wanting to set aside the so-called great tradition about Christ, the Trinity, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, I think, I, I think as we have spoken here in the, last, um, in the last few days, I have stressed the creedal because I thought that there would be less, um, less dissonance between my own position and, and those um, in, at Western yeah. who, who have a reformed approach to these things. And so that's, uh, that's a common ground that we can have. Mm -hmm. But I, I would think actually that tradition is much larger than a creedal thing. And that's why I use the term living. Um, and so, for example, um, let's see, going back to Acts chapter 2, we have the picture of the early church mm -hmm. gathered around the teaching of the apostles. But I would also want to um, exegete that passage as saying gathered around not just the teaching of the apostles, but also the fellowship or the koinonia of the mm -hmm, apostles. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, tone apostolum that, that sits between the words teaching and, um, and communion, it governs both of them. And so there are um, living parts of our, um, of the deposit of faith that's been mm -hmm. given to us that are not summed up by creed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but have to do with practice, have to do with piety, mm -hmm. have to do with a whole disposition towards living. Mm 
Um, so kind of the kerygma in the context of its owners, its bearers, the, the community for which the, the, you know, that, call, that the kerygma calls into existence and that perpetuates it by continuing to proclaim and practice. Yeah, but not just the kerygma, actually mm -hmm. um, the knowledge of those persons mm -hmm. and the sharing of communion with them, mm -hmm. an echo of the communion of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the communion of the saints. And so um, from, um, from the apostles and through the various fathers of the church um, coming, you know, there's not this huge void in my view, coming right down to the 21st century, there were mothers and fathers who taught us how it is that we should pray, how it is that we should comport ourselves um, with love and faithfulness and justice in the mm -hmm. world, um, how it is that we should worship that worship should include both a um, exposition of the word and a gathering, um, and the gathering around the body and blood of Christ so that we could share in him. Those, those things, some of those things are not doctrinal. They have to do with how we worship. That's they're right. Not just worship yes. up, they're not just thinking about. They're knowing persons and knowing the personhood of God. And some of those practices, liturgical and, and otherwise, are also some of the, some of the um, items in the New Testament for which we have only a limited amount of detail. Yes. And the church, even from the earliest centuries onward, has found ways to disagree about that, sometimes charitably and sometimes not charitably at all, arguing over uh, the date of Easter would be one of the earliest controversies that was not the most gracefully conducted controversy in the church, but uh, you know the Reformation is, is, is all about things that were practiced in worship as if they were apostolic traditions mm -hmm. for which the reformers wanted to say there's simply no persuasive argument or evidence that can undergird this claim that such and such a practice is an apostolic tradition. Right. and by other criteria, which uh, reformers were fairly big on, it's not useful for the church, and what's worse, it seems to, it seems to uh, pander towards superstition. So uh, it's an interesting set of criteria that they used for assessing both the authenticity and the utility mm -hmm. of so-called apostolic traditions, which were simply, simply rife uh, at the time. So, I mean, some of the apostolic traditions, so-called apostolic traditions, in the Catholic Church weren't even 300 years old. Uh, we know that. Yeah. Reformers had strong suspicions about the recent, recent uh, nature of some of these things. And so it, it was a matter of winnowing them out. Uh, hence the, 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 the impulse towards sola scriptura, which we know wasn't really a, a, a huge slogan, but it was a principle that was applied so it, you know, to ask, was this, um, can this be documented, can it be argued from Scripture alone, but is it also attested by the earliest centuries? It, you know, so it, it was important, not just that it's a, an argument to retrieve from Scripture, but they looked to validation from particularly the first five centuries of the church. The problem, of course, is that you end up pole vaulting over a whole number of centuries as though the Holy Spirit wasn't active there at all mm -hmm. um, because there's been, there'd been some abuse. And, and, the, and from my perspective, that, that's really problematic. And I think also it, it, isn't, it wasn't honest in the sense that there certainly were things that the reformers retained that had not been established mm -hmm. in the first mm -hmm. few centuries and that only, you know, I mean, 500 years is a long time, only were mm -hmm. established mm -hmm. by the first, by, by 500 years. So there, none, of the, none of the reformers would have questioned Trinitarian doctrine. Correct. But you cannot mm -hmm. derive that directly from the New Testament. You can see it there in Nuce. You can see that it was, it was leading that way, but you cannot see the very carefully articulated doctrine, or we wouldn't have had all the, all the uh, debates that we had in the church. Well, you certainly don't get the Chalcedonian distinctions, but you find some, some startlingly frank formulations Absolutely. in Ignatius of Antioch, which, well, which is a stone's throw from Go back to Paul, 1 Corinthians yes. 8, he reformulates the Shema, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. The hero of Israel, the Lord our God, uh, the Lord is one, and he says, for us there's one God and one Lord Jesus Christ. So at mm -hmm. least it's Binitarian there. And That's some of the there. greeting formulas um, right. have this, this Trinitarian or tri, tripartite structure, which are incredibly suggestive about what was not controversial 
um, in the earliest apostolic but writings. But it's not declared. No, right? it's we, not declared. It, you know, we would have to go to that to that uh, that verse in First John that isn't found in the earliest manuscripts to find right. anything at all close to actually seeing a doctrine declared. And yet the reformers didn't say um, this is this is negotiable because it's not it's not demonstrably part of the apostolic tradition. Well, you know? yeah, they, uh, because they were still confessionally Trinitarian and confessionally, for the, uh, this is a bit of a generalization, but confessionally uh, Chalcedonian as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, that's be but they will say that they were that because they believe the fathers got the scripture and the apostolic testimony perfectly correct on that, even though it was certainly contested as it works its way out. Mm -hmm. But the pole vaulting thing, um, it looks like they're pole vaulting over the Middle Ages as if it was, you know, a barren wasteland. I think part of the problem that they recognize is that uh, there are certain bright lights throughout this period, and I don't think that they want to say that the Spirit has abandoned the church. I mean, that kind of a discussion is more prominent in someone like William of Ockham mm -hmm. uh, than it would be in, in the Reformers. But they are, uh, they only have the, the, the sources, the printed sources to work with. They don't really have access to, you know, a lay person's Christianity or a lay, or, or a lay history. Sure. I think they believe that there were people who have a great piety. But in their own day, they see uh, consciences oppressed by requirements that they believe no one has laid upon them mm -hmm. uh, except those who have no authority to do so. And consequently, they see a very distressed state of the church and they are reading that into the past because I don't think they see evidence otherwise. And, and I think, I think that, that there is a, an understandable reaction that's taking place. Um, I think the, the difficulty is that reaction doesn't always produce um, balanced results. Absolutely. And so, Absolutely. you know, a lot yeah. of the baby mm -hmm. was, you know, the baby ends up throwing out, being thrown out with the bathwater. There's, there's a, a real nervousness um, about things that could be, if, mm -hmm. if looked at very carefully, I think, seen as the natural outflowing of the faith and as in continuity with the apostolic tradition, like mm -hmm. the whole iconoclastic controversy. I, I would have so gone there too. I'm worried about <laughs> images. Um, I understand why they mm -hmm. were, right? I yes. understand the superstition surrounding some of the use of images, especially, frankly, uh, showing my bias in, in the area of statues and three-dimensional three, three mm -hmm, things mm -hmm. because you're actually objectifying and you're thinking that thing has power. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I, I think that was a shame. You've also got urban legends about, mm -hmm. about the bleeding hose, yep, the yep, statues that yep. are bleeding, you know, when, when a Jew rushes into the church with a dagger and stabs an object and miraculously it begins to... I mean, the, 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 the urban legends are, are, are simply stunning. But I think that, you know, things like the, the festival of Corpus Christi, which uh, arises only in the 1200s, uh, was scandalous to many Protestants. I mean, the um, Heidelberg Catechism talks about the idolatrous mass, which uh, we think of as, as hyperbolic and inflammatory. But that's how it was experienced during a procession of Corpus Christi in the early 16th century, late, late Middle Ages, when uh, the consecrated host would be paraded through the city and people would fall down and, and weep before it. And so the Protestants saw people worshiping, offering acts of worship to, uh, you know, a container holding a consecrated wafer. And they found that, they found that scandalous, especially when coupled with uh, relative ignorance uh, of the benefits of Christ and the freedom that's to be brought in Christ and then couple that with all the, you know, Lenten observances and other kinds of uh, stipulations. It, it, was a, it was an oppressive burden. Well, and, and I think that, that the tone was set by the kind of language that was used in the medieval period of obligation, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. of the fullness of what we've received, not of how, for example, um, what, what was in the chalice should be understood as and, 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 and freeing as the medicine of immortality, mm -hmm. but as a kind of a, an oppressive authoritative symbol of the church. And so this language obligation then, I think, cause, causes reformers to push back and unfortunately to, to, to adopt the terminology of, 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 um, um, of the oppressor and saying, well, you say we have to, we're obliged to, we're saying we're not obliged to. Mm -hmm. What about changing the question. What about not using the language of obligation, but using the language of fullness and using the language of um, 
how it is that God uses many things to heal us, including um, the possibility of confession, including um, understanding that a miracle takes place in the Eucharist and so on. It was, it, the, the language was set and they, and, they, and they used that language thinking that they could actually get around and you end up with a he said, she said situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I agree that there are many things I find in Calvin that are best explained by his by a reactivity that he's in, in order to pull the pendulum to the center you have to stand on the extremes yeah. and I think that there are times when he does that issues of church music for instance uh, he, he's far more reactive than, than Luther was that's fairly well known but there are so many other cultural factors philosophical and theological factors uh, which could be linked to a different kind of tradition or rootedness not purely in scripture alone that are brought to bear on that, including uh, the you know, questions of what does embodiment mean? Okay, the word becomes flesh. Does that mean that the word becomes every, every means? Does, does every sacrament have to be interpreted materialistically, or is there some other way to explain that? So, uh, you know, a classic uh, Puritan response to uh, arguments about the real presence, you know, when, uh, and this is actually would apply to Luther as well as to anyone, when Christ says, this is my body broken for you, and he, presumably he's holding the bread that's been blessed and broken, is he really looking at the bread and saying that this bread is my body? Is it literally his body? So his body is holding his body, and there's a kind of reductio ad absurdum that is favored by someone like William Perkins, mm -hmm. who, who finds this to be, uh, to add a scandal to uh, the message or to, you know, to, to the right, that is not intrinsically meant to be part of the right. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the problem is that the language that was used, the philosophical explanations that would be given, you know, along the Aristotelian lines of substance and accidents, lent, um, lent a sense of mechanism, <laughs> lent a sense mm -hmm, almost mm -hmm. of magic to mm -hmm. any statements that something extraordinary was going on in the action mm -hmm. of the Eucharist, not simply in the actual, um, in the actual um, elements, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the performers reacted against what they were dealt with, right? Mm -hmm. it, but it seems to me that there is a way of talking about sacramentalism that comes from um, the early church, and by the way, from the early, the first five centuries of the early church down to us, um, that, that gives us a fuller understanding of what the church is doing when it's engaging in these things, and how it is that God actually is redeeming and recovering this world, and using the things of this world to point us to him. Um, allowing them once again, despite the fall, because Christ is trampled down death by death, to point to him and to even partake of, um, of who he is, that, that, there, that, that Christ fills all things, and as mm -hmm. a result of that, then the water becomes water that truly can cleanse and truly can refresh. Um, not just a sign of, of my allegiance, my personal subjective allegiance mm -hmm. to Christ when I go into the water of baptism, but that something actually is being done for me by God and by the church. Uh, yeah. It's it's one way to it's one way to read that sacrament. It's mm -hmm. not the it's not the way it's read by everyone. No. And so that leaves us with the question that not only do we have a great tradition that largely and properly unites Christians of so many denominations, but we also have subsidiary traditions that tend to, tend to divide us. Yep. And so how do we navigate uh, towards some greater sense of, if not visible unity, at least visible respect for some degree of legitimate diversity. So can a, can a Zwinglian and a Roman Catholic sit down at the same table of the Lord? Well, technically, they don't, they, uh, but why yeah, not? Yeah, I mean, the pro well, the, the problem, of course, would be um, the whole question of whether, whether they agree as to what is negotiable mm -hmm, and what mm -hmm. actually is back back to our words what constitutes the church mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and um if if someone in a catholic or an apostolic tradition considers that the church is something that's in actual contact with the apostles 
um, through some sort of apostolic succession, then mm -hmm. the answer to that has to be no, no matter how friendly those two people mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. They can meet perhaps on other grounds. They can meet on common, you know, common concern for the world. They can perhaps even pray together, but to do that would imply that they have a, a more intimate um, uh, sense of being together than is yeah. yet, th than yet obtains. And so I think ecumenicism has to be honest. I agree. It has, it has to be honest, including uh, some significant disagreements about what constitutes a meaningful apostolic succession. Yep. Uh, for which, you know, Calvin would say, um, if you haven't succeeded the apostles by keeping to their doctrine, what, uh, what matter is it that the laying on of hands has been continuous? Sure. And, and from, the, from the Orthodox tradition, I've heard an Orthodox teacher say, look, you could, you could drug three bishops and have them lay hands on someone, and that's not going to make that person a bishop, mm -hmm. right? Because there has to be actual intent, mm -hmm. as well as the tactile laying on of hands. The two things are important, not the one, not the other only. So I think that um, in the... the the kind of the kind of docetic idea of the church that it's it's simply a body of doctrine um, to which we um, ascribe and that makes the church um, from the perspective of the earliest fathers would not have been comprehensible. They would have thought that the koinonia of the apostles is just as important the actual physical uh, connections, the historical connections, as much as the teaching. Both are. Uh, who do you think holds to a, a docetic notion of the church? Um, those who would say that we can create a church de novo. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going back in my own experience. Mm -hmm. My husband and I um, were for, for a very long time Anglicans. And um, at one point he was offered, we, we had just finished grad school and there was a, teach, a small teaching position open for me, but not one for him. And so he was offered um, a community church to teach in. And that community really honestly thought that you could just simply create a new church um, independent of any, um, any historical connection with another church body when you get like-minded people who agree as to what they believe and how they will operate. I think there are many people who think that um, the church is simply a group of like-minded people who worship together in a certain way and act a certain way and believe a certain way and it can just, it can just uh, kind of be parachuted in somewhere rather than having an actual connection with all that's gone before. Well, There's that, a cerebral connection yeah. but not a, not a genetic one. If you but know. that sounds like an indictment of, of every congregationalist um, congregation or every all the whole traditions of congregationalism that see congregations as as autonomous cooperative ideally but ultimately um, not accountable yeah I mean I suppose mm -hmm. it is in that mm -hmm. respect mm -hmm. I'm not saying that there are not many good things about congregationalism mm -hmm. but, but but you know from where I sit that doesn't understand the true nature of the church as a tree that continues, mm -hmm. that begins with the apostles or with Christ, continues to live through the centuries. It's this idea that we could lop off one of the branches and stick it in the ground and then mm -hmm. it would sprout like, you know, when you do that with little plants and, 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 and that it doesn't have to have an actual connection. I think it does have to. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean the Holy Spirit can't be there. Right. Doesn't mean right. God isn't working there, but I think it's, it's not ideal. Oh, okay, I would, yeah. I would agree with that. I'm not a Congregationalist, I'm a Presbyterian and Presbyterians like to celebrate their connectionalism but that connectionalism is often on paper mm -hmm. because, and that's, that's yep. not necessarily a failure of will or heart, it's, it's really a, a recognition of the context of how difficult it is to get congregations in any connectional denomination or parishes for that matter to interact and to see their, their ideal as transcending. They see it you know, as, as a local franchise and have no interest whatsoever in the traditional doctrines, uh, the traditional identity, practices. There, there, there's just a sense that it's a very American thing, I think, mm -hmm. for, simply to, I mean, to join the local club, say, oh yeah, it's, we're Presbyterians, what does that mean? No one knows. Yeah. No and one knows. I mean, for me, that would be an argument for why bishops are a good thing, because they, you know, they preside over a larger um, area and can um, enable those um, whom they visit to see connections one with the other. Well, you know? possi possibly so. Uh, theoretically, Presbyterians have no bishop envy. No, I, know. <laughs> I understand <laughs> yes, that. Yep. Although, I mean, there are some who actually 
consider that the episcopate is actually right in the congregation, right? Well, <laughs> theoretically, the episcopate is yeah. at the presbytery level, yes. uh, which yeah. is the, the assembly of, of, of uh, elders of all kinds, mm -hmm. and that, has, that exercises the episcopal function, but, they, but people still resist it, even as most of my friends who are, in a sense, accountable to a bishop don't always find that a very happy relationship and find that bishops can also sow great discord. Oh, <laughs> as, as can independent people yeah. without yeah. them. So, you know, yeah. I mean, I actually would like to return to what scripture has to say about tradition a little bit because okay. the question, yes, that, yeah, I think it's good. we sort of jumped mm -hmm. into, you know, um, the church on the ground, but I think, I think it's helpful to remind people that, 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 that scripture itself commends tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in several places, mm -hmm. and that sometimes that's, that's obscured by the translations that we read, um, especially the King James and the New Living and the, the original NIV, tend to avoid the word tradition when it's used in a positive sense and only use it when it's um, applied to the Pharisees over there or to the pagans over here. Mm -hmm. And I think that many people would, would be really surprised to, to, to see how many times scripture is something, or tra tradition is something that the scripture commends. Um, like Paul um, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 talks about the importance of, um, or he actually doesn't talk about the importance of, he actually, he actually commands um, the Thessalonians to listen to what he had taught them, whether by word or mm -hmm. by letter, and actually not what he had taught them, but what we have taught is what he says, and I think he's not referring simply to the royal we, I think he's talking to mm -hmm. the apostolic mm -hmm. passing on of practice and faith there. Um, there's several points where Paul in his letters talks, he commends the Corinthians mm -hmm. for, to, for remembering him and for doing everything that he had taught them, um, and that he had passed on to them as traditions. So um, I, think, I think if scripture itself is commending tradition of a certain kind, not mm -hmm, human tradition, mm -hmm. not pagan tradition, not tradition that's centered only on Torah, but tradition that points us to Christ, well then it's biblical mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. hold up tradition as an important thing. And then of course the rub comes, well what's human tradition and what's, what's holy tradition? Well, maybe I can build on that because I, I fundamentally agree with what you're saying. Um, it seems to me, I have some, 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 I have students who will come from a particular kind of Baptist tradition that's claims to be non-creedal, and yeah. they'll say, we have no creed but Christ, yeah. which is simply a way of saying, I think, we don't write our creed down, it's unspoken, and if you cross it, you'll know it. <laughs> <laughs> so there is, a, there is a creed, we just don't yeah. admit to it. Uh, by the same token, uh, one reason to want to study tradition, both central and peripheral, both apostolic and what we, we might call kind of neutrally accommodated tra traditions that develop simply because it's a way of, 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 of applying or of embracing or practicing more the, local. the witness yeah. of, of, of the faith. We need to be aware of that as we read scripture because if we don't, it simply means we'll continue to be embodying a tradition, but it won't be a tradition we're very self-aware of. There'll be no self-critical perspective. And in a sense, we will be the tools of our own unspoken, unanalyzed tradition or traditions and assume that we are value neutral yeah. when in fact we know very well, especially in this day, that we, are, we never start from a neutral starting place. We always bring baggage with us. And so studying history, studying tradition, studying our own traditions and those of our closest neighbors and then even farther afield is a fantastic way to become self-aware yeah. that we have been formed long before we thought of wanting to be formed or aspiring to be formed, we have been formed both by cultural traditions of mixed value and even by a Christian tradition that, that comes to us in a sense already flavored, already, mm -hmm. already interpreted a bit, yeah. not necessarily forcing us to adopt it, but we want to, be, we want to grow more and more in our appreciation of you know, why as a Presbyterian we've read the Bible this way, and, and to be aware, it's not the only way to speak. It's, it's not the only Christian dialect, yeah. that the family is bigger than simply uh, those who claim the title of reform. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, um, I think that self-awareness is very, is very elusive for groups that claim that they have no tradition. Um, and um, 
you discover pretty quickly when you start questioning some of the things that are taken for granted that mm -hmm. there is a tradition there. For sure, even the tradition, you know, ironically of sola scriptura. Mm -hmm. That's, a, tra that's mm -hmm. a tradition, and sola scriptura. If it doesn't just mean um, taking for granted the interpretation that my community has given to these passages of scripture, then can mean actually, um, however I personally read the scripture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that nobody has a right to discipline me or to correct me or to call me to account because. There are many ways in which I can read, yeah. and um, I've chosen to read in this way. Yeah. Um, I think that um, also, don't you think that becoming aware of one's own location with regards to others who name Christ makes us a little bit more tolerant? I hope so. You know, I um, hope so. Yeah. I mean, I think I, think I, I was really quite amazed and here's something that I think often shocks people to discover that all of the reformers, even Zwingli, um, um, believed that it believed continued to believe in the ever virginity of Mary, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because I have come from a tradition that assumed that Jesus had, you know, um, brothers and sisters from Mary, and it, it was just it was there in Scripture, wasn't it? And it, and I thought, can't haven't they read the Scriptures? Never dreaming that there would be other ways of possibly reading those passages. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. It's, it's helpful, I think, for us um, to come to terms with where we are socially located mm -hmm. and, and, to, and to understand that others have been formed in different ways.